gentlemen, let's uh, please take your seat. Uh, we'll try to uh, start. Uh, my name is Christoph Bellman. I'm a senior research associate at uh, the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. I will be moderating this uh, uh, session organized by uh, FAO uh, on uh, agri-food trade, climate change, and achieving uh, the sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, and if I may, on behalf of FAO, I'd like to welcome you all to this, uh, to this session. Some of you might have been at a previous session that just took place uh, uh, a few minutes ago on, the, on G20 trade and climate change. Uh, this can be seen a little bit as a continuation of that discussion, but focusing much more specifically on uh, issues around climate change, uh, uh, food security, and, uh, and trade. Uh, I think the main idea behind the, behind the session is, uh, well, this first to recognize that uh, climate change uh, will uh, have, or the physical impact uh, of climate change, including changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, but also the kind of more short-term uh, uh, shocks and uh, uh, increased occurrence of uh, extreme weather events like floods, like uh, drought, uh, these are uh, likely to have an impact on agriculture yields, on agriculture productivity, on agriculture outputs. Uh, how and when is difficult to predict, uh, but by and large there is a kind of recognition that uh, such impacts will, will occur in different parts of the world. This in turn is likely to affect also trade and trade flows. Um, in, that, in that respect, trade is probably going to become uh, increasingly important uh, from a food security perspective uh, as it can help uh, uh, offset some of the, the climate-induced uh, production shortfall that, uh, that may occur and continue or enable countries to uh, have access to food even if they cannot produce it themselves uh, domestically. So, in that perspective, whether we like it or not, uh, trade is likely to become much more important uh, in any food security uh, strategies, and it's probably going to exacerbate some of the trends that we're going to see in the, in the, in the coming years. So in that context, uh, what are the type of uh, trade policy and uh, trade policy measures uh, that need to be implemented uh, domestically and internationally um, to try to at least enable, facilitate this role of trade uh, as, uh, as an engine or as a tool uh, for climate change adaptation, uh, while at the same time addressing also some of the mitigation aspects. So that's basically the question we're trying to deal with uh, today. Um, to do that, we are very fortunate to have four uh, excellent speakers. Uh, and I'm going to uh, introduce them one after the other. What we'll do is, is we'll just uh, ask them to make their presentation, uh, give them uh, 15 minutes each, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. Uh, we'll start with um, uh, Ekaterina Krivonos on my uh, left. Uh, um, Ekaterina has been leading the work of the um, trade team in the, in the FAO Trade and Market Division. Uh, prior to joining the, the FAO headquarters, she also worked at, as a trade and market officer in the FAO regional office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, she has also a number of experience uh, with very prestigious institutions, including ECLAG, the World Bank, uh, IDB. Uh, she's one of the best experts on, uh, on this issue, so we're very fortunate to, to have her with us today. Uh, Katia will, uh, I think, give us a little bit the general context uh, by looking more specifically at the implications of a climate change for a global agri-food trade based on the predictions from different uh, models that we, uh, that we have. Uh, so with that, Katia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Christoph. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Christoph on behalf of uh, us as organizers at FAO because he actually stepped in at the very last moment and uh, ICTSD has been a, a big friend and collaborator with FAO for many years. So thank you for stepping in because actually we face some emergencies um, in, in our team and uh, I will be making a presentation on the behalf of my colleague, George Rapsomanikis, who unfortunately had to 
uh, leave Buenos Aires uh, due to family emergency. So a real threat and uh, a very serious thing that um, all agencies, including FAO, should be looking at. And I think we're doing it in many different directions. However, from the trade and markets perspective, uh, considering that we are at the margin of the ministerial conference, this session is specifically on the linkages between trade, um, food security, and climate change. So I will try to set the stage with just a few slides without going into solutions because our distinguished speakers, uh, my colleagues here to my left, will speak more about possible solutions and instruments. And instead of that, I will just speak very briefly about what climate change implies for food supplies and trade. So we know what we're talking about based on different models and different research done by uh, various institutions and universities. So here, well, I'm Ekaterina Kirvanos um, and from the Trade and Markets Division. And George, unfortunately, couldn't be here. But that's why both of our names appear here. Um, first of all, uh, we recognize clearly the role of agriculture in achieving the agenda for 2030. So all these issues of food security, health, uh, rural development, nutrition, employment, they are all equally important in the FAO mandate. And climate change will affect many of these uh, dimensions. And especially when we look at the dimension of uh, food security, the four food security dimensions will all be affected first and foremost because of the um, effect of climate change on yields and the very differential impacts on yields across different parts of the world, water scarcity, but also importantly, a greater incidence of pests and disease. So there are some types of uh, pests that will be spreading faster. Access is of course affected by reduced incomes. And then there's utilization question, which actually uh, I didn't know until recently, but nutritional properties of certain crops will also change with temperature changes. So that's important for diets and malnutrition in general. Stability clearly is one of the biggest concerns given this uh, extreme events, extreme weather events and the implications for price volatility and disruption in supplies. So here's a type of meta study that FAO did as part of its uh, state of food and agriculture report uh, fairly recently where the, there is a comparison between a number of studies that predict over a horizon, over a certain horizon, how many studies predict positive effects of climate change and yields and which predict negative effects. And what we notice immediately, so the blue side, the blue colors is some studies that found that actually there would be positive effect, but these are very short term as you see. So these bars show the number of studies, okay? So as you move to the right, as you move in time, increasing the time horizon, more and more studies show that there will be negative effects of climate change on productivity in agriculture, and also higher effects, so higher negative effects. So we switch completely from the lightly blue bar to uh, orange and very red, in fact, as we move in time, um, 100 years horizon. Now, the regional impacts, um, it's very clear that the effects will be differential, that actually some regions um, are probably would even gain in productivity, and they will increasingly become net food exporters. This includes um, many areas of Russia and Kazakhstan, but also some countries in the, um, in the southern cone of South America. Here, Chile appears very clearly. But I think also even uh, for Argentina, I think it would be a question perhaps of north versus south. There could be some uh, changing patterns also within certain countries depending on the climatic conditions. So this is just one of the studies published by the World Resource Institute. Clearly, it's not, not all the effects um, are predicted the same across different studies, but it's just an illustration. Now, the effects of climate change for food security, they actually have different uh, sources of impact, and these vary greatly by region. So for example, if we look at Asia, most of the problems with production and productivity will come from floods. And then completely oppositely, um, and the opposite end, uh, Near East, so uh, I think it includes North Africa and the Middle East, but also Africa, it's really mostly problem of drought. So that's something that also makes it very difficult to predict the overall effects, considering that the drivers the, of these uh, effects and the extreme uh, weather effects will be different. Population growth is something that is uh, very important to, to consider in this whole picture because population growth is very different across different regions. And what we note from this graph is that 
very strong growth of the population in Africa, basically reaching uh, 2.2 billion people by uh, 2050, and possibly as many as 4 billion by 2100. This has, uh, it's, a, it's a double um, risk um, from the perspective of food security. First, because uh, many people um, among the poor depend on agriculture for their incomes, for their livelihoods, but also because we need to feed this growing population. So this is both an, an, a challenge in the consumption and the production side. So clearly we need uh, productivity increases, we need sustainable incomes, and, and we just need to feed these people with, uh, with diets that are balanced. Uh, and this is really the major challenge uh, from the perspective of climate change. Now, a few words about trade. Trade can promote food security basically because it allows surplus to flow to regions where there is, um, where there is high demand and not sufficient own production. So this is a very basic mechanism that I think uh, there should be no argument about and no misconception that this uh, balancing role of trade allows uh, the price variability not be as high as it could be. There could be, of course, uh, other effects, like, for example, trade is also has certain risk, again, from the sanitary and phytosanitary point of view, and there are many other effects we could uh, talk about, but I think in the, if we talk at the magnitude of these effects, the most important effect is really allowing the goods to flow where there is a demand. So that is something we very conscious about. Now, FAO recently conducted a conference on climate change, agricultural trade and food security, where many international experts participated, including David Blanford, who will speak next. And this is, uh, was the first attempt to bring the knowledge together, to bring the evidence, which will be also reflected in next year's flagship report on this topic state of um, commodity markets will be dedicated to problems of climate change and what the trade response should be to uh, counter the negative effects on food security. This uh, picture might seem very colorful and quite confusing. I, I, this shows, uh, so please don't pay attention to all these many trade flows between major producers and consumers. The only thing I wanted to show you is that this study by Porfirio and others from Australia, from CIRO, the, it shows how trade will actually increase as a consequence of warmer temperatures. So the uh, baseline is uh, the small circle on the left upper left corner, and then if the temperatures increase by 1.2 uh, centigrade, then you can already see that the trade, um, will be much, trade will be much larger, precisely because of the differences in, uh, in um, changes in yields across regions. If the temperatures increase by 2%, this uh, pie will be even bigger. So it's actually very little, we're talking about half, uh, half a centigrade that creates actually quite a big growth in trade between the different regions and countries. So it's just something to, to illustrate how the, what would be the implications for trade. When we then talk about the implications of trade policy and trade openness versus having trade barriers, again, there are quite a few studies uh, appearing in recent times, and uh, they show, you know, we can discuss the, uh, whether it's 1% or 2%, but in general, they do show, the vast majority of the ones we have seen, they show that uh, having more open trade is actually beneficial to, um, to minimizing the economic losses and the risk to food security from climate change. So, for example, one of the studies shows that the losses in GDP if trade barriers uh, are there at the levels of 95, let's say, they would be higher than as a, in the case where trade barriers are reduced. Then climate change effect on prices. Again, if there is uh, restrictions in trade, this price increase might be as high as 25% versus only 4.3% with free trade. Okay, I think this is uh, just a few words I want to say as part of setting the stage, and I'll give you back the floor. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Katya, for uh, for really uh, setting the ground for 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 our discussions and and sharing with us some of the the data and the analysis coming from the different models. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, is uh, David Blanford. Uh, David Blanford, probably known to many of you, uh, Professor Emeritus of uh, Agriculture and Environmental Economics at uh, Pennsylvania State University. He was formerly a uh, division director at the OECD and a professor at uh, Cornell University, one of the 
world's leading experts on food and agriculture, particularly uh, when looking at uh, environmental and trade uh, aspects, uh, with a lot of his recent work focusing more on uh, specifically on, uh, on issues around climate change. Uh, he has served as a consultant for a range of uh, uh, very uh, prestigious and leading institutions like FAO, uh, IFPRI, World Bank, and so on and so forth. So really happy to have you uh, uh, with us, uh, David. I think what David is going to do is take it from where uh, Katia left it uh, and uh, looking at, well, based on this kind of uh, diagnosis uh, and uh, the conclusions you're coming up with in terms of the increased role of trade in the future, what are the type of trade policy measures uh, that would be appropriate uh, as a climate change response. And I understand you will be focusing more specifically on, uh, uh, on border measures. Uh, that's a huge topic, a um, uh, lot of ground to cover. Uh, and uh, well, we look forward to your presentation. Um, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christophe. It's, it's very good to be here. I'm uh, first time in uh, Argentina, Buenos Aires. It's a uh, really beautiful country, obviously, and nice to be here. I'm also happy to be here with Katya, working with FAO uh, on looking at these trade policy issues relating to climate change. So I, I was asked to talk uh, at least to provide some perspective on aspects of trade policy and related domestic policies in the context of adaptation and mitigation, because these two things go hand in hand. I mean, this is what we're talking about. Countries have commitments in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Those are in their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Climate Agreement. And of course, uh, all countries are interested in what uh, climate change will mean for them in terms of adaptation. So I'm not going to be able to get into tremendous detail here, but I would just like to talk about a few key issues uh, that I think we need to be aware of. First of all, context, right? Agriculture, less than 4% of global GDP, 24% of GHG emissions. Uh, it's a huge issue thinking about the fact that uh, in the future, we're probably going to be able to reduce emissions in the energy sector. I think there's general agreement about that. But agriculture pre presents an enormous challenge, uh, not least because 92% of the emissions coming from agriculture and related changes in land use are in developing countries. So this is really why, why uh, food and agriculture uh, presents an enormous challenge uh, in terms of both adaptation and mitigation uh, in, in developing countries. I'm going to talk about essentially three things, three aspects. First of all, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the implications of internalizing emissions costs. Uh, and the border measures that are associated with that. We all know that, uh, in reality, if we're going to reduce emissions, those, the price of those emissions, uh, the cost of reduction, needs to be uh, reflected in goods and services. I mean, it, this, this is the way we will respond to trying to reduce our emissions intensity, is through having prices change to reflect those emissions. Second thing I'm going to talk a little bit about are government financial support measures uh, for mitigation and adaptation, uh, what's involved here. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about domestic adaptation policies and border measures. Uh, this is more specifically in terms of what Katya mentioned about uh, the ability of markets to stabilize the world food situation, which, which is an important thing. Basic issue that I'm going to get into, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't get into the details of specific articles in the GATT or provisions of other agreements, but I will make reference to some basic principles uh, in GATT WTO disciplines and, and the difficulties that these create uh, in, in the policy environment that we're dealing with in terms of constraining the policy space. Okay, so three things, first of all, to establish. Countries can do quite a lot in terms of internalizing emissions costs through directly through taxation, uh, regulation, uh, cap and trade, various approaches, uh, and countries are already doing this to some extent. The second thing is they can use financial support uh, to promote the adaptation or adoption of low emission practices, uh, consumption of low emission products. They can also use regulations to some extent to achieve that same aim. 
And then the final thing is that they can use behavioral change or they can try to change behavior, both in terms of producers as well as consumers, through information, through knowledge transfer, education, and so on. All of these are possible approaches. Well, I'm not ruling any of them out. And countries will probably be using these to achieve their commitments under the Paris Agreement to varying degrees. Now, there are some important issues relating to GATT WTO that we need to consider here, uh, relating to what could be used in, pol in the policy space. The first thing is that we have the non-discrimination principle, which is fundamental to the GATT. Um, in other words, we, we're really not allowed to discriminate, are we, amongst commodities, amongst countries, uh, through the use of internal measures or border measures, and, th and that's very important. The second area of, of discipline that's important are specific to the agreement on agriculture, and these relate to how disciplines affect government support, and in particular the, the boxes, uh, particularly the amber box uh, versus the green box, uh, uh, categorizations of, of measures that are included in the AOA. And then finally, uh, we have some issues relating to measures which are important, which are currently inadequately disciplined. And the key ones here are measures relating to exports, uh, export taxes and restrictions. And we'll see why those are important when we get into this question of the stabilizing role of markets. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about diagrams, but since I'm an economist, I'm obligated to show you at least one diagram. Um, and uh, the important point here is, that I want to make is this. If we put an emissions tax uh, on production in some way, we're going to have an effect, in this case, on imports. We'll also have an effect on exports. I'm just going to focus on imports. And uh, the key issue, then, is if that has an effect on imports, what will it do? What will it be? And how will it affect emissions in the country concerned? Okay? If we tax our own production, then imports will likely to increase. Uh, this is often referred to as carbon leakage in the sense that we are replacing some of our reduction in emissions by increased emissions generated by imports. Carbon leakage. Now, the problem with simply look, thinking about carbon leakage is that Carbon leakage, the change in imports, can actually reduce the environmental footprint or the emissions footprint of a country if, of course, the imports that are coming in have a lower emissions intensity than the domestic production which is being displaced. This is very important because what we really want to avoid, right, from a global perspective, is a misallocation where we increase the overall level of emissions because we're replacing lower emissions domestic production by higher emissions imports. On the other hand, if we replace higher emitting domestic production by lower emitting imports, then we have carbon reallocation. That's a positive. So we should not view carbon leakage to be unambiguously negative. In fact, carbon leakage, or at least carbon reallocation, is perhaps something we should be aiming for. It should be a positive aim in terms of our policies in as far as imports are concerned. Uh, I won't have time to discuss the export picture, but uh, uh, there are also issues associated there. One of the problems that we'll begin to get into here, it's just noted at the end of the slide, is if we choose to internalize the emissions cost by focusing on consumption, in other words, by putting in a consumption tax, that would have to apply both to domestic production and to imports, and this is where we start to get into the, the issues relating to the GATT, uh, because now imports are brought into the picture directly. Now, one of the suggestions that's been made, and there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion about this, is, okay, suppose we, we really want to keep out the high-emitting imports. How can we do that? The suggestion is, well, let's use a border tax adjustment. What's this? We're imposing a tax domestically. Some people are trying to displace our domestic production with high emissions imports. So let's tax those, right? Let's, let's impose a differential tax to keep those out. That's what this diagram shows. And in fact, if you, if you can do this, you can keep out those higher emitting imports. You can allow the lower emitting imports to come in. But what you'll do is to reduce your emissions effort. You'll reduce your mitigation effort, all right? 
The reason is that you will raise domestic prices and that will partially offset uh, the mitigation that you're trying to achieve. So it is possible to do this, but think about this. Suppose these other countries that we're dealing with have also put into place policies that try to internalize the cost of emissions. If we then tax them simply on the basis of their carbon content, it could very well be that they've completely taxed themselves for the carbon content, and what we then get into clearly is protectionism, right? Because what we're doing is double taxation. So in actual fact, even though this sounds simple, in terms of operational application, it's a nightmare. So border tax adjustment, you know, it opens the door to all sorts of uh, complaints, I think, uh, disputes I in the GATT. Okay, the basic problem that we face is this. Because each country is giving their own tests as to how they're going to achieve their emissions reduction and what they're going to do in adaptation, we don't have a global price for carbon. Now, economists would say, we really, you know, things would be so much simpler if we had a global price for carbon, but we're not going to get one. And the problem then is that if we use border measures to try to adjust for differential carbon taxation, we have to differentiate between products with different footprints. Now, as you're probably aware, there's a very important provision in WTO agreements which says like products have to be treated equally. The basic problem is this. When we have products with different carbon footprints, they're no longer like products. So we have a basic problem in terms of the like product principle, if you like, treatment. How can we resolve that? Well, I'm, I'm going to say two possibilities. One is to make some special exemptions, right? This could be through GATT Article 20. You basically say, look, you know, we all agree that climate change is so important that we can make some exceptions, obviously defined in terms of the way we treat products according to carbon footprint. I don't think personally that's on the, on the table. I think it's extremely difficult to achieve. So what might we do instead? I see that this has moved to different. Well, one of the things that we've been looking at and discussed in the meeting in, in Rome was uh, what about if we use a, a labeling, an agreed labeling approach? All right, so what we do is we say, okay, we will accept the fact that based on internationally recognized standards, we can identify the carbon footprints of various products, and we will not use this to restrict those access of those products at the border, but what we will do is to allow labeling of these products so that consumers can be informed about their carbon footprint. Okay? Now, the effectiveness of this, of course, depends on our ability to do it. The ISO, the International Standards Organization, is currently developing uh, footprinting standards and labeling standards. Uh, I've been in contact with some of the people involved with that, and they think it's certainly possible uh, for it to be used in this, in this way. The advantage of doing this is that consumers then would not only base their purchasing decisions on footprint, but on price. Some consumers could say, even if it's a higher price product, even if it comes from countries who pr pr pursue very strict standards, I will buy that product even though the price is higher. So that has a distinct advantage. The other thing is environmental agreements, regional agreements, uh, regional agreements which involve environmental provisions could help to promote this type of mutual recognition of standards amongst participants in regional and bilaterals. And finally, we could use uh, SDT, special and differential treatment, to give preferential treatment to products uh, that have a low carbon footprint uh, from, from the developing countries, particularly from the least developed countries. So there's a whole series of advantages. Briefly, because I know it's taking time, let me say something about financial support. First thing about this is government is not always needed to promote adaptation. Let's be clear about this. There's been a lot of work that shows, for example, many adaptation measures in production, in agricultural production, can be cost-reducing. In other words, it's to the advantage of producers to adopt those measures because they increase productivity. So actually, cost per unit of output goes down. But where that's not the case, then the question becomes, all right, if we're providing financial support, is it amber box, is it green box? Now, if you look at the current green box provisions, which presumably is what we would primarily be aiming for, 
I think the, the, the view is that they're not particularly well adapted to climate change policy. They contain elements, you know, the crop insurance, disaster relief, uh, structural adjustment provisions. But in terms of the specific conditions that apply to those within the green box, they're not particularly adapted to climate change. So there could be clearly an, ed uh, an argument for adapting those. The final thing is Article 6.2. Okay, now, the problem with Article 6.2, as I see it, is this, that quite a few of the measures that could be included under there, under that, or those provisions, are not adaptation measures, they're maladaptation measures. There are things like irrigation subsidies and power subsidies and things which we would suggest are not contributing to, to adaptation in a desirable direction. They're considered contributing to maladaptation. So we may to need to rethink what, are the, what, are the, what is allowed under, under the six point, Article 6.2, or who is allowed to declare under 6.2. Uh, finally, uh, and I'm getting very close to the end now, so you can breathe a sigh of relief, the adaptation and border measures in the context of the ability of markets to provide stability. Katia mentioned this, and it's extremely important. With increased production variability, we're going to face increased price variability in international markets, right, and domestic markets. So domestic policies and border measures can, can affect two things. First of all, how is domestic instability and in production transmitted to the world market, mm -hmm. right? And secondly, how is the instability globally shared or absorbed across countries? These are two separate things, and uh, in fact, the internal consistency of domestic measures can add to this transmission effect. One of the particular ones that's, that's a problem is stockholding policy. If stockholding policy is price sensitive to world prices, it's, it's an absorption stabilizer. If it's not, it's likely to be a transmission destabilizer. Okay? So stockholding policy is really important. The other things uh, are the disciplines on border measures. We've mentioned this particularly relatively weak on export restrictions and export bans. We've seen the impact of these in the 2007-9 uh, price increases. You know, seriously, at least somehow we need to get to grips with those, even if it's only in, in as much as transparency and the use of the measures, limited use, uh, notification and so on is used. And then finally, uh, I do think we need to take into consideration special and differential treatment in this area through the expansion of food aid provisions, particularly for least developed countries, because I think they're going to need it. So, final takeaway messages very quickly. First, basic message. Climate policies that seem to make sense from a national perspective may not make sense at all from an international perspective. Very important. Second, technical and legal issues make it very complicated to reconcile domestic climate policy and trade policy, and the potential for conflict between these is very high. In general, I think as Cathy has pointed out, global mitigation and adaptation is facilitated by freer trade. But national policies need to be consistent with that facilitating role, and that's absolutely crucial. SDT uh, is very important, and it, but I think we have to accept that if we're going to deal with climate change, there is a broad responsibility amongst many developing countries to play their part in this, and SDDT will need to be used in a more targeted way uh, if uh, uh, developing countries are going to contribute effectively to adaptation and mitigation. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, uh, David, for covering all these issues in uh, such a short am amount of time and at the same time really uh, highlighting what are the key uh, areas that we need to, um, to look at. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Martin Pinheiro, uh, who is the Director General of uh, the Grupo CEO and the Chair of the uh, Committee on uh, Agriculture at the Argentine Council of uh, International Relations, CARI. Uh, he's also a member of uh, Grupo de Productores del Sur, uh, Martin has uh, had an impressive uh, career uh, as Under Secretary for Agriculture in, uh, in Argentina and as a Director General of uh, ICA, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on uh, Agriculture. He's also been the member of the board of uh, many prestigious uh, institutions like, uh, like IFPRI. He's published extensively on agriculture, on development, agriculture policies. 
Um, so we're very happy to, uh, to have uh, Martin with us uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, Martin is going to talk more specifically on uh, issues around uh, market access and particularly as they pertain to uh, environmental standards. Uh, Martin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Christopher, for that very sort of impressive presentation. Um, and thank you, Katarina, who was the organizer of the, of the panel, to invite me to participate in it. Uh, I'm going to make a, a very, I think, very short presentation, and let me say sort of conceptual presentation, which goes very much along what... Uh, Dr. Bradford said. Uh, I will say it from a different perspective, with, not with the data that he presents. So I hope that everybody sees the presentation as complementary and not duplicative. <laughs> but let me, let me start by saying that I will then cover three points. And very, I, I will go very rapidly on each one of them and try to get to some, a specific conclusion. First of all, to say something that uh, Christopher mentioned at the very beginning, attaining glo global food security requires that trade compensates for geographic imbalances. And that's what I'm going to show the, the imbalances. Secondly, increasing food production to meet future demand has to deal with the problem of the agric potential agricultural contribution to global warming. And actually the message will be that maybe the problem is not that serious. And third, the convenience to reach a multilateral agreement to promote environmental standards, which is uh, something that Bradford already mentioned and I want to make a, a specific comment on that. So, let me start with the first thing. Let's say the, of the three issues, the first issue. Trade already provides 20% of consumption at the global level. And that is increasing very rapidly. It is projected, as you know, uh, figures from FAO, that in the next 20 years we need to increase, well, demand will increase, so production needs to increase 60 or 70 percent. Mainly, or very concentrated geographically in Asia. Not only in Asia, but very much in Asia. And very much in a few countries that are the main net importers. See that if you take China, forget about Europe, Japan, the, the countries in, in Near East, and Korea, that's 50% of all net imports. All those regions do not have abundant natural resources and thus will have great difficulties to increase production to meet the demand they need. So trade is the only way to compensate for that and to avoid global crisis or food crisis at the global level. The second issue is that to meet that demand, production will need to expand rapidly also in a relatively limited number of countries and regions. Not all the world can increase production. And if you see in my graph, if you take net exporting countries, you have, with, if you put together mainly Southern Cone and a couple of others, you have again 50% of all net exports. So global food security in the next 20 years will greatly depend on what happens in those countries. Now, increasing, pro increasing production will imply, at least potentially or in theory, an increase 
in the emissions of CO2. Now, here I want to make two, mm, two, specials, two special arguments. One is that those regions which are, have ample natural resources and tend to use an extensive agriculture have much lower emissions than the average emissions at world level. And that is more or less recognized, and there's uh, increasing information that tell us that. But in addition, I'm going to use very rapidly a graph by, prepared by Ernesto Vigliso, who is sitting here in first, <laughs> in first row, and that he will present the whole study uh, tomorrow in the think track uh, at 10th, 11.30. So I'm inviting you, those that are curious, on, uh, from what I say, are curious on how he uh, constructed all this argument, you can see him tomorrow. What is the main argument that Vigliso has developed using a, a large uh, uh, revision of literature, international literature? That the main argument is that the in, uh, the inventories are being calculated now, do not take into consideration sufficiently the sequestration done in agriculture, in extensive agriculture, and especially extensive livestock. And what it shows there is that if you take livestock, and uh, I don't know if everybody can see the graph well, but there are the emissions, the sequestrations, and the net emissions. And you can see that all the countries, but especially in Mercosur, but especially Argentina, are, are not, em, do not have emissions, but rather sequestration. So the impact of globe, on climate uh, or global change is positive and not negative. The next graph shows the same thing, taking agriculture as a whole. So what would those, those figures tell us? That really, if agriculture or the increases in production are developed in those countries and regions that have good agroecological conditions and good use, good use, uh, use good technologies, then the impact of agriculture will be, be, be much less of what is considered now or has been accepted now in, in general terms. In regards to the third point then, third issue, what has this has to do with trade? Because in the end, you know, this meeting is about trade. Not only this panel, the whole meeting is about trade. I think that the previous arguments show three things, that we need to do three things. First, improve our methodologies to estimate CO2 emissions from agriculture, taking into consideration the methodology that Ernesto Vigliso is proposing. Secondly, we need to promote good agricultural practices, something that Bradford uh, emphasized uh, considerably, and there is a whole bunch of uh, public policies that need to be implemented at the country level. But thirdly, I think that we need to include environmental standards in the multilateral framework. And this for two reasons. First, because there are already a large number of initiatives to, that are generating environmental standards of different types. And there can, these standards done by all, the importing countries by themselves can be very arbitrary, not respond to scientific evidence, and become, in the end, trade barriers. So including the discussion into the multilateral framework gives some guarantees that everybody will have an agreement on what are the, these environmental standards. Somebody in a previous uh, session was saying, well, we need to go into 
all the environmental standards at the same time. We are saying we need to start with a few, with the most important. And obviously, the, the, foot, uh, the, the CO2 is one of the major ones. Gas emissions is one of the main uh, elements to incorporate first, with priority. What we are saying, and there's a proposal that has been developed and will be presented tomorrow at 1.30 by Gustavo Idigoras, is that the logical thing to do is to agree on certain, a certain level of environmental standards. And on those environmental standards that are, are agreed on a multilateral basis, provide to those, and that this can be done by, on a product basis, agree on those products to give a faster market access or facilitate market access. This is the incentive and the main incentive for those countries that are exporting to provide or to implement all the public policies that we need to do at the country level that Bradford was explaining, uh, was mentioning before. So this is mainly, mainly the story. I think that if you take the three components together, it has considerable relevance in regards to global governance. I think that this is a matter for the WTO in regards to my last point, but is a subject for G20 to consider what elements can be done at a global level and at a global governance level to organize global agriculture and global food security items responding to some of the things that I was mentioning here. Bueno, thank you very much. Well, thank you. thanks a lot, Martin. And, and, uh, and as you said, I think it was really uh, useful and complementary to what uh, um, David said by, by looking at, I, I think, the specific case of, of Mercosur and, and also coming up with a very specific proposal, uh, which uh, I'm sure people would like to react to as we move to the um, uh, question and answer session. But before that, uh, we have a last um, speaker. Um, Daniela Alfaro, who is a professor of trade and agricultural development at uh, ORT Uruguay University. She currently advises the Minister of Agriculture in Uruguay. Uh, she has also been an advisor and secretary of the CGIR from 2010 to 2015. And, uh, and I have to say, until recently, a colleague at ICTSD. <laughs> Uh, she has published extensively on, on trade, on IP, on digital innovation, on food security, and has served as a consultant to uh, many prestigious institutions like the, the World Bank, IDB, ECLAC, FAO, uh, to, to cite just, uh, just a few. So um, Daniela is going to, to move us to a slightly different or uh, complementary aspect of the discussion, which is more looking at uh, services trade and the role of technology uh, in fostering sustainable agriculture and addressing food security concerns. Daniela, here you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Really, first I, I would like to, to really <laughs> highlight this opportunity, this side event of the, the WTO conference. There really is an opportunity to, to gather all of us that really we have to work and really am concerned to try to, to make trade more development and, and now in a sustainable way that it really is a, is a challenge. Imagine it's a challenge for all of us that work as a researcher. Imagine for those that are really working on the field to try to, to do that. And second, of course, to, to fall to the market and trade division in Fowl Rome that invite and give us this opportunity to, to interact. I don't know, Katia, if you really organize, but I think that after hearing my distinguished panelists, really is a really are very good, as we say in Spanish, hilo conductor, this, this, this conference. Well, uh, as Christoph mentioned, my idea, how we're going to organize, and I will try to be very shortly to, to allow discussion that I think is the most rich, the, the richest part of this kind of uh, event on, on, on panel. My idea is just, is just an introduction to review together the, the challenges that the agricultural face 
and more on that, the particular how the community, the international community, is working to, to face these, these challenges. Second, as I mentioned, the technology, the agrotechnology, how really is trying to, 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 to offset that, that. And I will put more attention in digital agricultural. And then, of course, because it's a panel of, of trade, I, will, I started to do this exercise that is, I would say, that reality new, how the different, how trade, how agreement, in particular the regional trade agreement, how we are trying, if we are incorporate or not, this new technology, how we are dealing with, with that. And in the end, of course, I will just to, to put as a case Latin America, the performance of Latin America in, in this, this plan here. Well, let's go. Here, like, it's just, I like this diagram because it shows that we all know it's the, the methodology that used that probably uh, knows in terms of the, the planetary boundary, highlighted the night planetary boundary. What is that? Is the, the planetary boundary intended to represent the Earth system process when if crossed, it could generate a sector environmental change that really could potentially endanger human existence. No? We know that there are two, uh, two of them that we see that is biophilic integrity and biochemical flows. The first one related to biodiversity, biodiversity losses, and the second related to phosphor and nitrogen that we know that the, um, the agricultural uh, uh, require and extract for plant and livestock uh, productions. And this is this particular, this uh, diagram that was um, promoted or elaborated in climate action, known as uh, the national determined contribution. Every five years, all the country need to provide to the world which actions should try to, to put on the, on the table in order to adapt to the climate change and to mitigate the, 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 the climate change. Recently, the, according to, to a research made by, by FAO, showed that really uh, agricultural looking and put on the table of all the NDC that is more than, than, than the 100, that agriculture is a priority in particular I, I don't have in mind now what in terms of mitigation and also adaptation, more than 90% of the country on NDC agriculture is a, is a priority because, as we mentioned, that is the, one of the main sources of green uh, gas emissions, so agriculture is a priority in NDCs. Second, and it's also a, a, a study commissioned by ICTSD, showed that half of NDC have a trade component in terms of of, of, the, of the importance component to mitigate, to adapt to the threat of climate change. This one, the last point I, I, I like to refer because this is a, it's a, a really a new process and as we know it's a bottom-up process because each country has to define by their own which policy have to do to, to, And I imagine that all of us, we testify that in, in our countries, we are really doing this exercise to see how we are going to develop which actions we are going to do to fulfill this uh, commitment that we put in the Paris uh, Agreement. And you know that the, the agency, the United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change, is the agency uh, behind under the framework of the United Nations who makes the, the, the follow-up. Similar to the process of the Paris Agreement, in terms of the agenda 2030, we also have the same process. And really, I like to contrast and, uh, and to see that the, the process is, all, of course, uh, everybody we know that agriculture in terms of sustainable development goals, more than seven sustainable development goals are related to that. In 2015, the CGR with other um, institutions make an exercise and identify that more than 62 targets are related to food system in a direct or in indirect way related to, 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 to agriculture. And then, um, uh, I think two months ago, FAO also showed, and in, in terms of the, 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 the report and the, the follow-up, show that he can, uh, FAO can be the custodian agency of 21 indicators uh, on that. So really, it's something that is very interesting comparing the past with the role of the, of the international 
uh, institution, how now the, the people, all of us, we are involved in this process. One month ago, I was in, in Uruguay, and I visited, invited by the, uh, the, 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 uh, the government of a, a, a small town, and it was incredible that seeing the, in a, a small town, in a, in a square, a small square, that it, I, I saw the, the SDG, the 17, that people are working to that. So it was really incredible how really the commitment that all of us has on that. So really the, the, the involvement of the, the community, the people, like give us really a lot of hope that really the, the process could achieve to 2030 the goals that everybody agree through the agenda 20, 2030. So with this exercise, just to see that it started to be with this exercise to the convergency among agricultural trade and, and climate change. And of course, this is something natural because the 70 goals, they, they really try to look for a war in a sustainable development. So it started different areas to converge, and this is something that we have to, to all work in, in, in different way. Well, here is just to show that the different approach that all we know and they are um, put on the table by different organizations. But all of us try to seek, to all of these approaches, agricultural approach, try to seek to minimize the environmental externality. Just the organic agriculture developed by, by the USDA, the conservation agriculture by, by FAO, agroecology by a movement in San Francisco, the ecological incentivization, who have the opportunity to work with this CIRAT, the, the um, center in, in, in France, Sustainable intensification available by UK, the sustainable farming system by the National Academy, no? and also the precision agriculture. That just to mention that all those, all of them try to face the concern of planetary boundary and the triple burden that I highlighted at the beginning of, of this presentation. So, taking into account the, the last one, the precision agriculture. I like to try to, 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 to present, to introduce, or to put in the debate the role or the opportunity of digital technology. Just to wait, no, something. Um, well, something wrong here because the idea is to show three bubbles uh, there. I don't know if you see in the, yes, there, yes. Well, I'm going to explain. The idea here is to show which uh, technology are already in place related to agrotechnology. Agro One is high technology, which precision agriculture is, is, is there. Uh, also include uh, big data, also include um, platform, the, 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 the world that the marketplace, the world, or so all related to, um, to high technology. The, the other value is biotech. Yeah, molecular biology, and the other one is uh, related to, 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 to energy. Just the idea, my, my idea is to focus on digital technology and to, to show that this one I already in place and the implication that I have. And let's show you this phrase uh, that was um, say at the World Economic Forum last year, say the growth in the agricultural sector can be at least twice as effective in reducing poverty and promoting growth, in particular with the cooperation of, with new digital uh, technology. The last one is those technologies that are really in place, that are working, that we are we're, we're using, generating or adopting this, this technology. This one is a very interesting, and I'm going to ask, is it technical? Yes, can, can Joe. This is a, a, a really strong power developed by the United Nations World Food Program. That's how do we envision the future and show 128 technology in different six scenarios, seven here, yes, transparency food, for example, and show those technologies that really are ready for, are, de are underdeveloped or ready for, for adoptions, and the, the, size, the size of the bubble show the, the impact of this uh, technology. And this is amazing because, for example, here you say inside this uh, one in this classification used by the, the, this program show different technology and show how readiness is, is, is it 
and show who are developing this DJ. Really, I, I invite you because it's an exercise that helps you to imagine how you envision, they envision the future with this, all this uh, technology and the impact that, that, uh, that uh, they have. So thank you. Go back to the presentation. As I repeat, the imperative of all of us is just to boost the, the agricultural productivity in a, in a sustainable manner. So we are talking, when talking about the uh, technology, we are talking about innovation. This year, the Global in, uh, Innovation Index, you know, uh, show that, uh, that you know, that is more than have a, uh, an annual report working more than 10 years, recognize that trade is a factor of innovation for, for a country. For the first time, um, the agricultural sector, and with this title, Innovation Feed in the World, was selected at the, at the panel. Okay. Well, this is just to, because I only have one minute, to, <laughs> just relative uh, to finding in uh, saying, leading that really smart and agricultural, digital agriculture is the way to overcome serious food, food challenges. Let me emphasize, if I can use this one minute more, because I think this, this idea, how, trade, how in, in the different regional trade agreement uh, we see this, this topic. First of all, that's really sustainable development because it becomes an objective of the regional trade agreement. Second, that e-commerce was included in, seven, in 67 regional trade agreement. I will say here, or I like to emphasize here that e-commerce, you know, everybody will say that covering e-commerce in a chapter of regional trade agreement, we are saying that we are covering digital economy. No, I think it's a very trivial or superficial way to cover what implies digital, digital uh, economy. Internal services related to agriculture, modern biotechnology, this is it's in a chapter of the TPP that was covered the modern biotechnology in, a, in, the, in the chapter two. Reinforce the move forward in terms of agreement of SPC and technical barrier to, to trains and strengthen intellectual property related to agrotechnology. Well, some key evidence here is related to that was repeated, so I go quickly through, 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 through that. I, will, I like to, to emphasize here in terms of agrotechnology that says there is a consultancy made by a, the advisory a group, Valerie Advice, similar to McKenzie, say that here in South America is at the field of promise, but there is until and top investment potential in agrotechnology. And according to the global innovation indices, yet no Latin American country have been identified as innovation achievers yet. So it's something that we need to explore and to work more on, 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 on that. Here is just is an example of how Uruguay could be a leader in terms of livestock. You know that here is a, a, a country that moved forward in, in terms of the traceability. And also related to, to what Martin suggested, it's one of the first countries that started to measure the, 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 the emission of, of a green cars emission for the agricultural sector by production, by existing, and by, 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 by source. And it started to, to see some result and as the minister says, it's a win-win scenario because it started to produce, mad, uh, more, produce more, 50, 50 percent of with miti mitigation in terms of the reduction of methane emissions, right? Well, here the, the opportunity ahead that have Uruguay to include the agreement, at least in, in a bilateral way, and last week we in, a, in a mission to, to China, with China started to recognize the, the certification uh, in terms of the, 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 the beef export to this, to, the, to, to this market. To work more in terms of uh, indicator and try to align the, uh, I am part of these two groups, it really is not working very well in terms of SDG and NDC, there are different departments that are working this one. Well, key findings, so more or less what I have been saying, and I'm going to here at the, the, the last um, slide, some recommendation that they like to put forward here on, the, on this uh, panel. First of all, I would like to highlight that we need a new trade agenda beyond the, 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 the traditional uh, regional trade agreement 
that incorporate climate friendly and agricultural products, and this is related to those uh, sustainability standards that really started to be recognized uh, by the importer country, but also an effort to, to the exporting country. The digital trade agenda, this is something related that is, has not been discussed yet in the, in the, in the, in the, in the trade agreements, neither in, of course, at WTO. In terms of innovation, we need to work more in terms of pu public and private initiative and in hub cluster to tap the potential of digital technology in, here in, in, the, in the region. And this is something that I really like to discuss to improve the metrics and start to use integrated indicators with these three variables that I, I mentioned at the beginning in terms of trade, climate change, and, and, and agriculture. And for those, we need at the international level to define the institutional role to track process towards a more sustainable food system, but also in our uh, countries, not only at the national level, also at the sub-regional level, sub-national level, to defend really the clause and to work in a coordinated way. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Daniela, for uh, I think for bringing that that additional dimension, uh, including the the, the role of uh, trade agreements, uh, including regional trade agreements, uh, in uh, helping scaling up and diffusing uh, the right type of technologies that uh, will be needed to uh, to address some of the climate change. Uh, challenges we face in the area of agriculture. So that takes us to the uh, to the end of uh, the first you know, round of uh, presentation. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just open the floor uh, for uh, questions, comments. Uh, if you could just you know raise your hand, identify yourself, and um, and, and and ask a question. Floor is open. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Foss of uh, IFPRI in uh, Washington previously with, with FEO. Um, I'd like to thank the presenters for giving actually a very nice trajectory into the topic. It, uh, in the beginning, it gave the, the sense of, okay, you, you're giving a lot of primacy to trade in solving sustainability issues next to food security issues. But as we went along, we made clear that the real question is not uh, how trade can work to solve those issues or to, to adjust to those, uh, <coughs> to the, the climate change or food shortage, climate change problems or food shortages. But the question really is how trade rules can be made consistent with policies that make agriculture sustainable, food systems sustainable and, uh, and accessible to, to everybody. Uh, so uh, in a way, it's, it's not the question like how the trade regime um, can provide these incentives, but firstly, as Pascal Lamy said, uh, I think seven or eight years ago, that the multilateral environmental agreements should prevail over any trade rules. So the trade rules should be adjusting to those agreements, right? So, which means, uh, and I think that's the heart of the problem, what I think what David emphasized, if we cannot align the trade rules with national policies that provide incentives both to producers to get to more sustainable agriculture and consumers to consume uh, products that come from more uh, sustainable agriculture, then we will never get to a solution. So trade is just a small part and probably trade policies are just one small element next to the bigger elements that come from national policies that have to drive food systems into a more sustainable direction. So it's not a question, but Thank it's a comment. Like Thanks. If you can just pass the mic to the David Laborde next to you. <laughs> so David Laborde from IFPRI. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, to some extent linked to the point made by, by, by Rob uh, about the hierarchy between international treaty. And in the presentation made by Professor Blanford, if we start to discuss uh, border tax adjustment or uh, uh, different carbon tax, we have the feeling that we should move to a consumer-based accounting system for emission. When the current international rule is, it's a producer-based commitment. So, 
And if we keep this, so the current framework, it means that a country that is reaching is a Paris Agreement target should not be threatened by any taxation, whatever produce, pro, uh, produce he will produce, because he is reaching his international commitments in terms of mitigation. So now you can start to say what we do with countries that are not part of the agreement. And then you can start to apply duties, so additional duties, or just different set of things, uh, knowing that uh, at least from not applying duties, we have a WTO case that show that if you are part of international treaty, you can benefit from some preferences. It's what the, the EU has argued to do the um, special treatment for uh, some uh, developing economy that were part of non-nuclear uh, proliferation treaty and blah, blah, blah. It was objective. It was no more subjective. So is being part and reaching the um, Paris Agreement will be a good way to discriminate if you want to do carbon adjustment. So that's my, my second part of the question, you know. Um, and uh, because the first part is, do you believe to, that we should move in the consumer-based accounting system? Basically, first part. And if not, if we keep on the producer, why do we want to start to discriminate for countries that are reaching their uh, Paris Agreement? No, my, my second question is more about one of, of the fear I have about the trading system in the context of uh, climate change is about when we are going to see more surprising pest and disease in different regions of the world and policymakers are going to panic and activate different SPA that no one was thinking before. Um, so do you have some thinking about this? Do you think that the current SPS agreement is well designed to deal with this kind of, let's make sure that we, we can avoid a panic reaction, or do we want to see more um, forward-looking discussion on this topic? Because that will be potentially a big disruptor. Thank you. Thank you. I think these were quite a number of questions. So, uh, David, you want to uh, to... To answer them, let me, and then we'll go back to see if there are more uh, more yeah, questions. Uh, let me let me take uh, the one about uh, consumer-based accounting. Um, uh, if if of course you follow uh, the life cycle standards approach that the ISO is developing, that would be consumer-based accounting. Um, so it would make sense to use that. I think. Uh, I mean, the important thing is this, isn't it? That that. Uh, you have uh, an approach, a methodology uh, that is accepted. So it, 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 it's, it, it has scientific credibility, as was mentioned here, and that it can therefore be accepted, accepted by the countries that if this is applied in the way that it's supposed to be applied, it, it is legitimate to do so. The, the fact, though, however, does that necessarily solve the, the maladjustment problem that you can have because you don't have a uniform carbon tax? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Because the real problem with the Paris Agreement is that we don't exactly know uh, how countries are going to achieve those objectives, and we don't exactly know, uh, you know, how much is going to be the implicit carbon tax that they're going to use. In some cases, it may, the implicit tax may be zero, <laughs> right? Uh, in others, other countries have been far more specific, proposing, you know, 30 euros or whatever, uh, and so uh, per ton. And so th that raises all sorts of problems. And, and I don't think we can solve that uh, given the inf infrastructure that we currently have under the Paris Agreement. I don't think that's solvable, but I think we can at least address the footprinting issue and trying to get the consumption and production effects that we want from having that as a transparent mechanism through what I've been proposing through using international standards. Because producers will have an incentive to reduce carbon footprint. They'll be looking for the technologies and the ways to do this. They'll be searching for those because they'll, they'll want to appeal to consumers. And uh, as a result, it provides an incentive to do that. And for consumers, it provides a, you know, a clear indication of the implications of their purchasing decisions. So I, I think that's the basic thread that I would argue for in response to your, your question. Thanks. Um, 
I'll, I'll give the, the floor to to, uh, to Katia on the on the SPS issue. But before Martin, do you want to react on on the on the, the first point? If I understood you correctly, you were sort of saying, is co the COP process sufficient to go where we need to go? And I think that the answer is, 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 uh, is no, yeah. in the sense that the COP process is fine, is important, etc., but there is no mechanisms to provide the appropriate incentives nor the appropriate governance mechanisms. There's no compromisos, firmes of doing things. So obviously, in my mind, the COP process should be much more closely related to the G20 and to the United Nations process. Katia, on, on the... Yes, yeah, so I wanted to make a comment in response to David's question. In fact, we had a separate presentation on this topic in this conference in FAO, I think two weeks ago, and it was very. It was a presentation made by by Finland on behalf of IPPC, the International Plant Protection Convention, because in fact most many of the risks will be on the phytosanitary side, and it was very clear. He put some very specific threats on the table, and it was very clear that the current systems, not in the international, but the national, are not um, fitted for coping with the future challenges, because some of the pests might be new, some of the pests might be the same, but are just spreading faster. And his point was that in order to fulfill the international agreements, such as the SPS agreement, and we all know that it really boils down to scientific evidence, that scientific evidence will be harder and far harder to produce because the time of reaction will be shorter. So if, like you said, if a country panics, oh, it might be very legitimate panic. The point is that for them to be, because for the phytosanitary standards, there's no a standard. It's not like they have a maximum residue, like in the case of food safety. It's more guidelines and, and standards for producing the scientific evidence. And many of the countries, especially the developing countries, will not be able to produce the, um, the risk assessments that are sound enough to show that this is really, uh, they have to close the borders for a specific pests. So it will be a huge, huge challenge, for, for sure. I, I don't have a good answer on how the agreements have to adjust for that, but, but that will be one of the challenges. Thank you. Any other uh, question from the floor? <laughs> well, if that... If that is not the case, uh, let me maybe give the speakers a last uh, opportunity to make uh, short uh, concluding remarks. If you don't have to, but if you if you like to, uh, uh, before we uh, before we close the session, and maybe let me start in the reverse order. Daniela, I pass. <laughs> Taking the, into account the, um, the proposal of Martin, and it's very related to, to the professor's side, I would say a multilateral, multilateral agreement, but in a voluntary basis, and really provide some guidelines, but I think really the commitment of the country, I, I like the approach that we are using, that bottom-up approach, really. Some guidelines, no, but not sanctions to fulfill, the, the, and, and more in particular in the agricultural sector. David? Just a very brief comment. I think, um, in, it, it, I think it would be a mistake simply to focus on the trade dimension of what we face mm -hmm. here with climate change adjustment, and it requires a broad-based approach in terms of domestic policies, mm -hmm. both to, oriented towards production and consumption, mm -hmm. as well as appropriate international policies. It, we need the entire toolkit, and it's going to be different for different countries in terms of what's appropriate and what's feasible. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, just one last sentence that uh, David summarized it very well. Mm -hmm. we, it is mostly national response to increase resilience and reduce vulnerabilities that, uh, that will matter the most, far more than trade. Actually, most studies show that it has to be a response on the production side. I just wanted to leave you with one thought that uh, whatever countries do on the production side, they also have to consider the, uh, the pos uh, possible negative externalities. So as David said earlier, 
national measures that seem quite good for, for the country, they might not be optimal from the climate change or food security perspective. So it, there is uh, still a debate to be made what kind of policies in agriculture are actually uh, climate compatible. Okay, so I think that leaves us to, uh, to the end of the, the, the panel. Maybe just one quick kind of uh, remark on my side. I, I, I think what we've heard, if you look at all the different presentations, I think we, we're basically facing with three main, three main issues in this, in, in this debate uh, and from what we've heard. Uh, the first, I think, is, is the point that has been made uh, that uh, trade can be an, an important tool in, uh, in adaptation. Uh, by enabling countries who cannot produce uh, uh, or who are faced by shocks related to climate change to uh, access uh, uh, food at affordable prices when they, when they need to. And, 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 and the recommendations that would come probably from that, uh, that uh, uh, diagnosis is, is probably that having some, uh, at least some level of free trade is probably very important in that, in that, in that respect. The second set of issues I think that we are facing is the fact that when dealing with climate change, uh, countries are going to put in place a number of uh, domestic measures. And uh, the extent to which these measures may or may not be compatible uh, with uh, trade rules uh, can, be, uh, can be an issue. Uh, and, and if there is a conflict, uh, uh, what to do about it and what type of response uh, would be needed uh, uh, nationally, but also from the international communities. And that has to do with uh, border measures, that has to do with um, uh, domestic support and a whole set of issues that uh, uh, David mentioned. And the final set of issues is maybe looking also at how uh, uh, trade and trade policy instruments may be supportive of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 actions that will have to deal with, uh, uh, with climate change through the diffusion of technologies, the liberalization of uh, environmental goods and services, and uh, uh, different kinds of methods that would provide the type of enabling framework that would really enable uh, a rapid scaling up of uh, uh, technologies that are important to address uh, uh, climate change. So I think these are the main elements in, 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 this, in this debate. Of course, the debate is only starting. Uh, 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 the more we dig, the more we understand the complexities around it. Uh, and uh, I, I think we'll continue the discussion. I understand that FAO will dedicate quite a bit of work in this area, uh, particularly next year. So we look forward to seeing more analysis coming from that. So with that, please join me in, in, in thanking and applauding our, our excellent speakers. And we'll put an end to the session. Thank you.